Good day to you all. My name is Elliot Raises from the CDC in the US, and I'm pleased to open what I hope will be an informative and helpful uh, symposium on the COVID-19 pandemic. Coronavirus, or COVIDs for short, are a large family of viruses. Of the seven COVID known to cause human disease, or generally cause mild illness like the common cold. However, three of these pathogens, all beta covs can cause lethal human disease. These include SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and now SARS-CoV-2. It's important to understand that we use the term COVID-19 to describe the illness caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2 because it is genetically more like SARS-CoV than MERS-CoV. COVID-19 appears to have been first recognized as a human illness in late 2019. We don't know, yet know exactly when, how, or where this virus arose. We believe it represents a cross-species transmission from an animal reservoir, very likely bats, that may have been involved as may, may have been involved as an intermediary animal host. Most of the early cases, but not all, were linked to a market in the city of Wuhan in Hubei Province, China. However, during January 2020, cases rapidly spread to people with no known exposure to this market, presumably through person-to-person -person contact outside the market, and that amplified the outbreak. By mid-January, COVID-19 had been confirmed in almost every province in mainland China, with the greatest number of cases in Hubei province, the darkest pink area in this map, centered within the province's capital and most populous city, That, this figure shows daily numbers of new cases reported from China, which is shown in green, and from all countries outside of China, shown in yellow, as of March 5th. Early in this pandemic, spread of COVID-19 was limited mostly to China, with two large increases in mid-January that were actually related to a change in the Chinese case definition. However, as of February 25th, the daily number of new cases outside China now exceeds those within China, and from March 4th onward, the number of daily deaths from COVID-19 occurring outside China have exceeded the number within China. By early March, COVID-19 had spread to other parts of the world with remarkable speed. And almost all countries have reported cases with the most recent increase in reporting countries in the Americas and Africa. As you can see from this epi curve, Europe and the Americas are reporting the vast majority of daily new cases. However, in Africa, testing capacity, the ability to implement social distancing measures, especially in crowded urban areas with informal settlements, and the decreased capacity to manage critically ill patients in many of these countries are all causes for significant concern. So now I'd like to move on to describe some of the data we know about the clinical epidemiology and transmission of COVID-19. To give you a sense of the relative frequency of the major signs and symptoms observed with COVID-19, I am showing here these data from three reports describing hospitalized patients in China. More than 80% of patients develop fever during illness, over half develop cough, and about 25% myalgia or arthralgia with a small fraction developing headache or diarrhea. Although fever is the predominant sign of illness, one report observed a much lower prevalence of fever at presentation of only 44%, even though most of these patients eventually developed fever. Shortness of breath at presentation even among hospital patients, hospitalized patients does not appear to be as common as perhaps originally reported. These signs and symptoms of COVID-19 are consistent with what we often call flu-like illness. Unfortunately, at this time, no particular set of signs or symptoms or related clinical findings can reliably clinically discriminate COVID-19 from other respiratory viral illnesses, such as influenza. Most people present with subacute or acute onset of cough and fever. Fever may be measurable, but as I noted earlier, 
not all patients have a measurable fever presentation. And they may describe, although they may describe feeling feverish and then later go on to develop actual fever. I also want to highlight that there are some reports of persons presenting with isolated GI illness, specifically diarrhea that has preceded the development of cough and fever by a day or two, in addition to some recent reports of loss of smell and or taste as, a presentation, as an early presentation. In terms of the age distribution of persons with COVID-19, these data from the largest Chinese surveillance report to date show that most patients have been middle-aged adults who also comprise a large part of the general population. I want to make special note of what may appear to be very limited amount of SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 illness in children. Some reports do suggest that children are equally susceptible to COVID-19 as adults, at least as adults under age 50. If true, then the data presented here likely represents underreporting of pediatric infection. This kind of underreporting may be due to a decreased likelihood that children will present for clinical care because we know they experience milder disease than adults. Adults, especially adults over age 60, experience significantly more severe COVID-19 illness and are more likely to die as reflected by these case fatality rates or CFRs shown by the yellow line and y-axis to the right. In the U.S., the most recent mortality data suggests that 9% of deaths due to COVID-19 are, however, in persons less than 55. A number of factors can affect the CFR, such as the number of people tested. In outbreaks, the most evidently ill person with a higher risk of death tends to be tested first. As more people with less severe disease are tested, the increasing number of total cases will include more survivors and thereby lower the CFR. In addition, how, how many people die depends on how quickly illness is recognized and how well it can be managed. Deaths will be higher where sufficient life-standing support is lacking. The current best estimate, which admittedly is a large range at present, is that the case fatality rate is likely somewhere between 0.5 and 3.5%. By comparison, the CFR for seasonal influenza, at least in the United States, is about 0.1%, meaning that COVID-19 could be five to 35 times more deadly than seasonal flu. Despite the important concerns about case fatality rates, most COVID-19 illnesses are, and we expect will continue to be, mild, and most patients will recover spontaneously with some supportive care, especially children and middle-aged adults. In the United States, based on data coming from 14 states participating in our surveillance network, hospitalization rates increase significantly by age. Respiratory secretions are the main mode of COVID-19 transmission. and Infection is spread through respiratory droplets in the air and that land on surfaces. Exposure to infected stool or feces may transmit some infection, but at this time does not appear to be a major contributor to new illnesses. Although SARS-CoV-2 RNA is readily detectable by RT-PCR in feces from persons with COVID-19, there is only one report of replication competent virus having been cultured from stool, and there has not been clear evidence of infection spread sol solely by exposure to infected feces. Recommended infection control practices for managing feces should pro provide substantial protection against infection through stool exposure. Perinatal transmission in its purest sense has not yet been observed. SARS-CoV-2 RNA has not been detected by RT-PCR in amniotic fluid, cord blood, neonatal throat swab, or breast milk. We also know that the amount of virus shed from the respiratory tract of infected and ill people is greatest at the time symptoms start, and then it declines. What this means exactly in terms of the presence of infectious virus has yet to be fully worked out and is a major focus of our work at CDC. For those of you familiar with HIV viral load but new to CT values, think of them as the inverse of each other. CT values, 
or cycle thresholds represent the number of PCR cycles it takes for the test to detect the presence of viral RNA. So in this case, a lower CT value means it took less time and therefore more viral RNA was present in the sample. So lower CT values correspond to higher levels of virus, hence the configuration of the y-axis as you see here. We are also gathering increasing evidence of transmission in the pre-symptomatic or even asymptomatic phase of illness. In a study in Singapore, we had seven epidemiologic clusters which were identified and, and we had likely occurrence of pre-symptomatic transmission for 10 cases. And these, ca these cases tend to do, uh, have symptoms occur about one to three days after the test was performed. Also in the Kings County out near in Seattle uh, nursing home outbreak, 13 of 23 patients who tested positive for COVID-19 infection were asymptomatic at the time of the test, and 10 of those 13 then developed symptoms within seven days of that positive test. And modeling suggests that this mode of spread could be even more significant than originally thought. This recently published model simu simulated outbreak spreads in China under two scenarios with different, differing transmission rates from undocumented infections. The red bars is the evolution of cases in a hypothetical outbreak using estimated per individual infectiousness for persons that is half the efficiency of documented infections, whereas the blue is the same hypothetical outbreak but assumes that undocumented infections are not contagious. You can see that the red curves seem to be similar to what most countries have experienced. In a, in a recent uh, publication, we put out on outcomes by underlying health conditions in COVID-19 patients here in the United States. We were able to evaluate over 7,000 uh, cases. And what we found that was that 71% of the hospitalized and 78% of the ICU admissions had one or more designated underlying conditions with the most common conditions being diabetes, chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, immunocompromised condition, and chronic renal disease, whereas only 29% of hospitalized and 22% of ICU admissions had, had no, none of the designated As you will likely hear from the clinical presentation, lymphopenia has been observed in hospitalized patients, though it is still not clear if that increases the risk of poor outcome in the setting of HIV. Nonetheless, we should all take precautions given this is a new virus. Pregnancy um, with current observational data shows only is only for women in the third infected in the third trimester, and it appears thus far that maternal mortality is similar with, as I said earlier, no uh, infection transmitted from the egg, at least documented. Finally, I think I think this recent uh, paper by Lipsitch in the New England Journal does a good job of summarizing what some of the key epidemiology questions we're going to need to try to answer um, as we move forward with both the uh, management and the investigation of this uh, pandemic. As we are dealing with the strain on our healthcare system, we are also trying to gather as much information as possible to inform our mitigation strategies along with future containment. In the U.S., we want sicker patients to seek hospital care while those with mild illness self-manage at home to reduce the strain in the healthcare system and our PPE supply. The challenge is, the challenge is coming up with proper screening tools to differentiate the two. Zero prevalence surveys of households and communities are now being performed to help determine the prevalence of asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic illness among persons who have never been tested for COVID-19 using PCR to help inform many of these questions along with case control studies. Further studies on viral shedding also will be needed to better determine infectiousness during recovery and from surfaces, just to name a few benefits of 
the states. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your comments and questions following the excellent presentations to follow. And most of all, thank you for all the heroic work you do on the front lines of this unprecedented global health challenge.